My name is Daniel Golden, and I'm a senior editor and reporter at ProPublica. At today's event, held in partnership with the Virginia Center for Investigative Reporting at WHRO and the Chronicle of Higher Education, reporters and editors will discuss how university expansion has uprooted communities of color across the country. At the end of the program, we'll take some time to answer audience questions. Before we get started, I want to note a few housekeeping items. This event is being recorded, and a link to the video will be emailed to everyone who registered. Closed captioning of the program is also available and can be enabled by clicking on the closed caption option on the bar towards the bottom of your screen. It's been my privilege to serve as the editor on this investigation. My participation actually began a year ago. I was reviewing proposals for ProPublica's local reporting network when I came across a fascinating one from Lou Hansen and Brandy Kellum at VCIJ. They proposed an in-depth look at a largely forgotten episode in Virginia history. In the early 1960s, the then all-white city council of Newport News, Virginia, decided to establish a public college in the middle of a thriving black middle-class community, even though more suitable and less expensive locations were available. The city seized the core of that neighborhood by eminent domain, forcing families to leave the area. Over the ensuing decades, as the university expanded, it acquired almost all of the remaining homes. It struck me that this project was very relevant to political debates today about systemic racism and its impact on our society and about how race relations in American history should be taught. And that what happened at Christopher Newport University and Newport News has likely been replicated at campuses across the country, suggesting that even universities normally considered bastions of liberalism, bear a responsibility for black land loss and lagging rates of black home ownership. Partly at my urging, we greenlighted the project, which I'm happy to say has resulted in several compelling articles and a documentary film. In response, a Virginia state representative has called for establishing a commission to investigate the issue and other elected officials have started talking about potential redress for dislodged families, such as free tuition for their children. Christopher Newport President Bill Kelly has acknowledged that the university's progress, quote, has come at a human cost, and we must continue to learn about and understand our complicated history. I'm now going to turn this over to Lou and Brandy, who will uh, host in, uh, the panel discussion and talk with our experts. Thanks for attending. Hi, I'm Lou Hansen, uh, co-founder and senior editor at the Virginia Center for Investigative Journalism at WHRO. Thank you, panelists, for being here. And thank you uh, to Brandy, who will introduce herself. Uh, let me unmute myself. That is, uh, <laughs> that's a Zoom Zoom issue, but um, okay. So yes, um, as Dan mentioned, um, the story that was initially pitched um, was about uh, a local university uh, in Newport News, Virginia, Christopher Newport University. And um, through reporting, we had discovered that there were several dozen families who had been displaced in the 1950s and 60s. And this had been widely, well, not widely, it was reported at the time during the 1950s and 60s. However, what interested at least me in even starting this investigation about two years ago is that there were still houses left in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. So what led to the investigation was the fact that there were still families that remained in the area, even after the initial blow to the community, which was essentially the city of Newport News, seizing the core of the community, which was about 100 acres at the time. They took about 60 acres in the middle of that to uh, establish a location for Christopher Newport. And um, what we learned over time was that not only did this happen in the 1960s, but there were families still there. And then they had also fought to save the community in the 1980s. And even now, as you read in our story, there are only five houses left. The Johnsons, who we were able to access, they were very gracious in giving us access to their entire archives. And we were able to fully tell the story of the Shoe Lane community as it had never been told before 
because of what the Johnsons had saved um, to show evidence that people really did live there and have fought to save their community over time. And Lou had done a large part of the research in terms of urban renewal and eminent domain, which we know was a big part of how this was able to happen. So Lou, I'll turn it over to you for uh, the broader scope of eminent domain and urban renewal and what you found and how it played a role in this being able to happen to this community and other communities across the country. Sure. What interested me about this story is I, I'd been a, ver, a reporter in Virginia for nearly 20 years and written a lot of land use stories, property stories about new development coming and going. But when Brandy had this idea for a project, it was something that was a bigger scope. It was telling a bigger story um, through one family's eyes in Newport News. And we were able to look at what really this displacement and loss of homes meant for a community and for a very personal story. Um, and it was more uh, it was more than just the dollars and cents. And as we started reporting this story uh, over a year ago, we started to learn that this didn't just happen in Newport News. This happened in Norfolk, Virginia. This happened in Boston. This happened in Chicago. This happened in Philadelphia. This happened in Berkeley. This was not an isolated incident, even though many communities felt like these were isolated incidents and it was only happening to their neighborhood. This was really part of urban renewal writ large in the 50s and 60s and 70s and continued. This was a well-established playbook by a group of leading universities that other universities and colleges latched onto over the years. And they sold themselves as economic development um, uh, drivers in cities that were desperate for good paying jobs and, and growth. Um, and they did bring, bring growth and they did bring good paying jobs. But our stories looked at, at what cost and the other side of that narrative. So um, really fascinating to learn a lot of the details about how this happened in the 50s and 60s and how it's still happening today. So um, I think we have uh, a great panel to share even more expertise on these uh, uh, stories. And so, uh, Brandy, do you want to start the introductions and we'll just kind of take turns? <laughs> yes, so very excited to have four amazing people, experts and scholars on our panel today. Um, as Lou said, we have a great discussion lined up, so I'm going to get right into it with introducing uh, two panelists here. Uh, we have Mr. James Burling. He is with the Pacific Legal Foundation. He's the vice president there for legal affairs, and he's a leading eminent domain lawyer and expert. Um, the Pacific Legal Foundation has represented property owners, plaintiffs before the U.S. Supreme Court. So we are looking forward to Mr. Burling's knowledge about, as Lou was saying, eminent domain and urban renewal. And we're going to get into uh, Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander, who is from Norfolk, Virginia, um, has a lot of knowledge and expertise about local communities and um, the seizing of property, especially with communities of color, Black communities in the area here. She is a Norfolk State Endowed Professor of Virginia and Black his History and Culture, and she's the Emeritus Director of the Joseph Jenkins Roberts Center for African, for African Diaspora Studies. So those are uh, two of our elite expert panelists, and I'll let Lou introduce the other two. <laughs> sure. Um, we also have Liddell Winling, and Liddell is an associate professor of history at Virginia Tech University. He's the author of Building the Ivory Tower, Universities and Metropolitan Development in the 20th Century. Liddell is also the co-creator of the online project Mapping Inequality, Redlining in New Deal America, which was a vital resource for us in our research. Um, Liddell is also director of the Chicago Covenants uh, Project. Welcome, Liddell. Um, and our fourth panelist is Nolbert Chavez. He is an elected member of the University of Colorado Board of Regents. He's also chief of external initiatives and community engagement at CU Denver. He's a former four-term member of the Colorado House of Representatives, uh, and he has been instrumental in gaining recognition and funding for the descendants of the families displaced by the construction of CU Denver campus. And that's been a long effort and a long process. 
Um, so, uh, Brandy, why don't you kick it off with the first question? And panelists, we'll we'll start off with a question for each of you, and then we will keep the conversation flowing. All right. So let's get right into it. Uh, James, we'll start with you because we talked a lot about eminent domain and urban renewal, and I think it would be a good idea to define that for the audience here and sort of explain eminent domain, how it works in practice, and how it has played a role in urban renewal policies um, that, that took shape during the 50s and 60s. So the early English common law had a great deal of solicitude for private property rights. This is where you get the language that a man's home is his castle. And not even the king can go into a man's castle, no matter how rude the castle may be, how small the home may be. It may be a shack, the wind may go through it, but the king cannot. But there's one exception. A great uh, scholar and jurist of the, 19, of the 18th century, a gentleman named William Blackstone, wrote that there is one exception, and that is eminent domain, called it the great despotic power. If the government and the legislature need private property for a public use badly enough, they can take it. They have to pay just compensation for it, but it can be taken because there are times when government needs are so great that the great power of private property has to stand aside. Now, the problem is that that sounds well and good. And indeed, that was put into the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, where it says, nor shall private property be taken for public use except for the payment of just compensation. So the idea of public use of the property being taken was very, very important. But over time, that got to be changed a bit as necessity got in the way and railroads needed property and mills needed property next to rivers, for example, for a water wheel. Uh, it became more and more that private property could be taken for semi-public uses railroads that would allow members of the public on. And that eventually got transmogrified in a case in 1954 out of Washington, D.C., where Justice William O. Douglas said that you can take property not just for a public use, but for a public purpose, because a public purpose is equivalent, he said, to a public use. And that was in an eminent domain project where portions of Washington, D.C. were slated to be redeveloped. It was a heavily African-American area of Washington, D.C. There were Jewish businesses there, but it didn't look terribly blighted. And people complained, said, look, my property, my department store is not blighted. Why are you taking it? And the Supreme Court said, because the entire neighborhood is run down, is somewhat blighted, this property can be taken. And that leads to the question of what, what is the excuse you can use to take property for redevelopment, which is essentially a private use serving a public purpose, I suppose. And so then you get questions of, well, how run down is the neighborhood, how blighted is? But the fundamentalist question, who decides that? And there's back and forth of the Supreme Court joking about, well, your neighborhood's blighted. No, your neighborhood's blighted, that kind of thing. But the fact is, people that look like me would go into majority minority neighborhoods. And what they see was this not look like my neighborhood. This looks like a rundown neighborhood. Of course, it's blighted. The best thing is to, to save it is to destroy it. And so eminent domain has taken this long path down from a rather noble use to a really an excuse to get property for higher purposes of the moment, redevelopment. And if you're dealing with neighborhoods that uh, one isn't familiar with, then you think those neighborhoods are worth less than they should be. And that's how eminent domain has uh, spun its history in the last century or so. Well, that's really, that was a great overview of eminent domain and how it has essentially evolved over years to be, uh, um, to have, ha so that more entities can have access to it essentially. And um, that kind of leads me to Liddell who has a lot of knowledge and experience and how colleges and universities have been able to utilize this tool. You know, our investigation centered on uh, one family in Newport News and they lived there for over 80 years and lived through eminent domain and the, um, the remnants of it. And uh, by way of making way for a college and university, I think most people when they think eminent domain don't think colleges and universities. So if you could explain to us, 
how colleges are able to take advantage of that and how widespread it was for colleges and universities to do so. Um, sure. So first I'll say um, there is nothing special about a college or a university um, in the way that it relates to um, urban development or as uh, an economic, economic driver in metropolitan regions. We certainly have this idea of an ivory tower and that there's something like separate or unurban about them, but it's not the case for like the last 150 years, at least universities have been um, providing jobs and economic growth, just as, for example, factories would and hospitals do sometimes now um, in conjunction with universities. And so we need to think of them as um, not a like special case, but right, like one that we should recognize is much like much like any of these other kind of urban urban development issues and urban institutions. Um, their specific work in taking advantage of urban renewal um, um, federal legislation um, comes out of the 1950s. Um, there's federal programs. There had been um, slum clearance and urban renewal legislation in the 1940s and the 1950s, and a number of universities, um, largely in large industrial cities, Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, Seattle, um, were concerned about kind of the transformation of their cities. One, um, essentially that there've been demographic changes, largely with uh, um, second wave of the great migration, um, but also after the kind of disinvestment of the Great Depression and of, the, um, of World War II, um, university leaders said like, we're trying to educate the public. We're trying to um, make the world safe for democracy. We're trying to win the space race and we're doing it in um, surrounded by neighborhoods that um, faculty don't want to live in, that students don't feel comfortable in. And they were overstating their, their case, but um, they kind of worked collectively to lobby um, federal legislators and um, presidents to um, pass and sign urban renewal legislation that basically incentivized and put them in the driver's seat that, that drove um, urban renewal money to cities if they kind of worked in favor of demolishing neighborhoods and um, parcels that, um, that, that universities wanted to redevelop for campus expansion, for um, research centers and so forth. Um, the University of Chicago was like the key leader of this, but basically, um, any major research university took, um, took advantage of this. And what has happened since then um, is that like these leading universities and leading administrators, like they share information. Someone um, like starts work as uh, an administrator at like say the University of Pennsylvania. And then later on, they get a better job, more powerful job across the street at Drexel University, and they employ many of the same kind of redevelopment strategies um, that they did at, at places like Penn. And so what we see is this um, information being shared and through institutions like the American Council on Education, the Association of American Universities. Um, and we see these practices, not just how to get research funds um, or how to educate undergraduates, but how to take land, how to redevelop, how to um, employ kind of like um, financial techniques in order to kind of um, expand um, throughout the city, the host city. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I found fascinating about your, your work, Liddell, and also should mention uh, your colleague, Rob Nelson at the University of Richmond, who also did a lot of work on this, in just one federal program between 1959 and 1965, um, 20,000 families across the US were disrupted by university and college expansions. 8,000 of those families were, were 
um, were black or Hispanic. So overrepresentation of of minority communities being displaced by these college expansions. Um, and there really was a playbook that was going on in the early 50s and uh, the 50s and 60s. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Newby Alexander, I, I'd like to um, to ask you a little bit about when colleges and universities were were coming at this time to expand and looking for for land and property. Um, often they were coming into black neighborhoods, as we saw in Newport News, as we saw in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, what was the power structure like for black families in the 50s and 60s? What was the effect of these fights on those families and those communities? Thank you so much. You know, one of the things that we have to do is put the 1950s and 60s into the context of what was happening in America. Uh, the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision, for example, really put the framework of how governments were going to respond, especially governments that were directly impacted by that decision. And for the most part, it was in the South, Midwest, um, where the majority of those cities and counties would be impacted. So we would see a huge movement, for example, of counties that were suddenly starting to consolidate into cities uh, to provide the separation um, because they, you know, in Virginia, of course, they incorporated counties. And so you would have uh, a city and all of the uh, uh, all all of the the students would go to that particular city schools. All the counties would go to, unlike in North Carolina, for example, where you have a county and you have all these cities in a county. Instead, you had a county and the students would only go to the schools within that county. So we would see the creation of Chesapeake. We would see the creation of Virginia Beach here in Hampton Roads, but that would be duplicated throughout Virginia. And then you would see some other things going on in other states that had a, a very different setup. And this influenced the direction that they would take. So you would see the use of eminent domain to wipe out Black neighborhoods to prevent any kind of integration. You would see, for example, in Norfolk, uh, uh, an individual who was a realtor. This was a Black realtor, and he wanted to create middle-class Black neighborhoods um, in the way that government was funding uh, middle-class white neighborhoods and suburbs. He was doing this with his own dollars and the and a consortium of other investors. And the city stopped him uh, using the threat of eminent domain and paying him literally pennies on the dollar if he did not sell for a much lower price than what he actually was planning on on getting as he developed that property. And so cities were and counties were using eminent domain as a, a vehicle to stop integration, to forestall the 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 any opportunity that um integration would occur naturally. For example, in a section in Norfolk called Atlantic City, that was an area that was inhabited by both blacks and whites. Norfolk wiped out that area entirely, claiming it was disadvantaged. And of course, this also ties into a lot of redlining policies. They wiped it out because that would have been Virginia's first uh, uh, area that would be integrated naturally because people were living almost side by side, both blacks and whites. And so this is an area that they decided would, would eventually uh, become home to Norfolk General Hospital and is now part of the Sentara complex, EVMS's complex. And so they took land from both Blacks and whites, but mostly from Blacks. And that, that land then was given to these other institutions to grow and develop. And African-Americans were essentially paid pennies on the dollar for their land. So we would see this kind of process um, uh, being used in the 50s and then in the 60s as well. Always a fear 
to accompany the fight of school integration. But you would also see this, this, I guess, effort on the part of a lot of cities to simply erase Blacks from the landscape. So in Virginia Beach, for example, areas that used to be Princess Anne County, where you had a high number of African Americans who were owning property, um, Virginia Beach would pass laws saying that the owner, the landowner, had to improve their property, had to pay for water and sewage to be brought into their property in order either to renovate their property, build on it, or expand. And of course, that uh, price was too high for them to pay. So a lot of African Americans sold their property because they simply could not do anything with the current property as it existed. Yeah. So we see a lot of different avenues for for cities and counties to force black families, communities into certain places or to force them out altogether. It was usually to force them out of places. And this also mm -hmm. accompanied uh, the laws that that were passed beginning in in the 1930s. Um, to restrict basically Blacks to the inner cities uh, as whites uh, were able to get property in suburban communities. Sure. Well, I want to get Nolbert involved in the conversation too. And, and uh, Nolbert, you have a really interesting story. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about where the uh, University of Colorado at Denver was, was situated? and uh, the Orarian community um, that was once a thriving place. Um, what is it now? Tell us that story. So, so the Auraria redevelopment project is, is very similar to, to ones you've heard of uh, already, uh, except that it, it happened in Denver and it happened to a, a, a largely Latino neighborhood. 95% um, of the neighborhood was Latino at the time, and it was a very close-knit uh, community. Um, the city had done its best to um, discourage folks from living there and trying to get folks to move out by uh, zoning the the entire neighborhood as industrial. So anytime anything would happen to uh, one of the residences, they couldn't rebuild. Uh, which is also part of the game, uh, the gamesmanship uh, that is associated with paying uh, fair market uh, when when a, a community is displaced and it's uh, out of all the homes are are not properly zoned, they're worth less, and therefore the the city or the government has to pay less uh, for those folks who are uh, forced to leave. Uh, but they were. Uh, th there were 343 families, uh, 900 people. The largest displacement in the city's history uh, occurred in order to create the Auraria campus, which is home to three institutions, the Community College of Denver, Metropolitan State University of Denver, and the University of Colorado at Denver. And, and at the time, promises were made to the, to the neighbors in the community that that their children and grandchildren would be able to go to school uh, for free. And, and then over the uh, subsequent years, those promises were, were largely unkept. They, they, all three institutions used every uh, you know, barrier they could think of to, to, uh, to get folks not to, to, to uh, try and, and avail themselves of that scholarship. And, and so in uh, 20, 20, November of 2020, um, the University of Colorado, uh, Denver, Metropolitan State, and the Community College of Denver, we all got together and extended that scholarship in perpetuity. And, and we did so, um, number one, to fulfill the promise that was made uh, to, to, the, to the neighbors and, and to try and um, go from truth, telling the truth to, to reconciliation. And, and that really is the, is, is where we're headed. And, and, and that's the work that, that I do on a daily basis. It's also this, the subject of, of my uh, doctoral dissertation on, on how universities 
can and should uh, reconcile with, with communities that are affected. And, and since then, we went to the state legislature and, and got $2 million um, of scholarship money because, frankly, the state was, um, was responsible for the displacement as well. Everyone was, was really responsible. The federal government through, through, uh, through HUD and, and, uh, and the city, um, the church, the courts, and, and ultimately the state. So um, our first step was going to the legislature for for help with that scholarship fund and um, and we'll continue to do so at the city level and and, and anywhere else where uh, th those responsible should be held to account. Nolbert, that's an incredible story. And in my reporting and looking at other communities that have been displaced, I was unable to find any more recognition than beyond, I think, uh, maybe plaques and letters of commendation for displaced communities. So the fact that you uh, were able to get $2 million in scholarships for displaced families um, is an incredible feat. Well, you know, it, it, thank you. It, 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 was, uh, it was a lot of work and we all came together to do it, all the community and all three institutions. But it did help that I uh, had served in the legislature, knew how the process worked, and and uh, was able to 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 lead us uh, to to that uh, that eventuality. But but there's actually more than more than that because um, one of the other panelists was talking about the five remaining homes. We actually have 13 homes that were saved at that time in the in the 70s by Historic Denver, uh, and they went to the city and they said. You know, we want to save something of this neighborhood, and and the city said, sure, uh, as long as you do all the work and raise all the money, you can do that. And and so they did, and they they took one single block, and I'm sitting in one of the houses that was saved, um, and 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 today we have uh, a park, Ninth uh, Street Historic Park, with 13 homes uh, now. They've not been well maintained, and for the last fifty years, it's been sort of um, benign neglect. And so, one of the other things that we've done is is to invest um, our resources and private fundraising to restore and honor the sacrifice that was made by those families, and and to invest in it in a way that folks can see and reconnect and visit and and remember. Uh, what they what they had, and so those those thirteen homes were were lucky to have that, um, because in most other instances, there's really nothing left. Well, that's a that's a that's a great segue uh, into a question that um, we'll we got. We're going to get into some questions that were um, submitted, but. Um, and that was me that mentioned the five homes left. Um, by the way, there are five homes left in Newport News uh, that in this area in Newport News that were uh, of this largely black community that um, essentially the name of our story is erasing the black spot um, and they essentially were erased um, because of the expansion of uh, the uh, university there, which is actually going to get into a question that um, we quite saw often that was submitted in some of the pre questions sent to us, which was how was this able to happen. And I know we get into a, we got into a little bit of eminent domain and the tools that were used, but I would love for someone or a few people on the panel to kind of illuminate this aspect of power. We, Dr. Nui Alexander, you talked about power structure a little bit earlier in these communities who um, were up against more um, rigid policy that was established and um, widely used during the 50s and 60s urban renewal. And so I love for um, you all to talk about the power structure in terms of who benefited from what type of uh, people or entities benefited from this the most and how were they able to do this um, during that time period, um, given what we know about that time period. We know that it was, as you said, Dr. Newby Alexander, a highly segregated um, time period in the country. But beyond that, um, how was this able to become so widespread given the power dynamics of that time? And who paid? who mainly paid for this? <laughs> 
I would like to jump in very quickly. Uh, I'm sorry, James, did you want to say something first? No, no, you go right ahead. <laughs> um, it really wasn't until the 1960s that you would begin to see African Americans being either appointed to the planning commissions or um, in the later latter part of the 1960s, and I'm talking about here in Virginia or in the South in general, um, or, or winning elections. And it was usually only one African-American either getting appointed or winning an election on the city council. So for the most part, these decisions of urban renewal, which way the railroads would go, what land they would take over, wh where would the interstates be placed, all of these decisions were made exclusively by whites. And even when you had a few African-Americans either on city council or in the state legislature, it would be the bureaucrats who are all white who would make those decisions as to the routes that would be taken, whose land would be taken. And they were still using, and it's interesting that the Army Corps of Engineers still uses these old, um, very racist ways of evaluating someone's property value based on what realtors, which are almost exclusively white, what they would determine is the value of property. And so you still have these, these very old policies and templates that are, are really the um, wedded in a lot of racist uh, thought and evaluations uh, being used today by and in the past by officials when they're making decisions about how to uh, take, what property to take, how to take it. Um, planning commissions, uh, someone mentioned the whole idea of rezoning areas. So a lot of properties that were initially scheduled, like, you know, you know this in, uh, with Christopher Newport, a lot of those properties uh, were, were for residential and then they rezoned that area to as a way of facilitating not only taking the property much more easily, but also paying less on the dollar. Yeah, and to follow up, I, I that's, a, that's an excellent history. And if you look at the way the legal structure was put together and what it takes to go into a community and take that community over, it very much makes it easy for the power structures, you call it, to take over a neighborhood. To be declared, one of the prerequisites in many instances is that the property has to be blighted. But if you look at what blight means, it, it's, well, the definition that's common in all 50 states is where it's pretty much similar to this. You have to find properties detrimental to the safety, health, morals, and welfare of the community. And there are factors that you look at. Is there a diversity of ownership, meaning that different people own different homes? Well, that's my neighborhood. Is it is the infrastructure inefficient for development and transportation? Well, my neighborhood's a cul-de-sac, but you're not going to find anybody finding my neighborhood to be blighted, um, except with rare occasions. There's a congresswoman in San Jose who had leaves on her tennis court, and she was called blighted, but they wanted to get at other property. So this definition of blight is very, very loose. It requires factors such as you know peeling paint. We heard before about grass growing in a street uh, that's a city street. So you have all these factors that go into determining something is blighted. But the fundamental problem is the bureaucrats, as Cassandra called them, that determine blight are people who do not understand the value and worth of a community. They do not get out of their car and get off the checklist and start asking people who live in these homes, what's it like to live here? Do you feel a sense of connectedness to this community? They don't ask those kind of questions. You don't go to the pastors of the churches and saying, what's this community like? You look at this community doesn't look anything like something that I want to live in. Therefore, what an excellent place to put the superhighway through. And, you know, I, I'd just like to add on to that. There's a myth that city leaders and urban renewal folks want you to believe, and that is that they're saving people from blight and squalor, as, as one person shared with me, and, and helping them out of that situation. That is not true. The, the, the research is clear. Uh, folks that are, that are displaced are moved to other areas that are considered blighted, and, and, and they, they are not helped. 
uh, by this process. And, and, and that, is a, that is a myth that, that they continue to perpetuate um, and, and, and not even refer to what is lost, which is that sense of community, which is, which is the biggest uh, uh, trauma to to folks that are displaced is, is their sense of community and connection to uh, to those that they lived with before. Yeah. Yeah, it's like during <laughs> Vietnam era, in order to save a village, you had to destroy it. Uh, yeah. Very much the same thing here. In the first great Washington, D.C. case that I mentioned from 1954, there were over 1,400 families displaced. Uh, of the 5,900 new residences that were built uh, in an area that was 99% Black, only 310 units were affordable. People were just moved out. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Could I also pile on a little bit here? And that is that today you see cities still using the um, demographics of an area to say, oh, we need federal funding to help uplift this community, et cetera, et cetera. And they have, there's no policy in place that says you have to, you have to create housing for the people you are displacing so that they can return or so that you can restore them to that location. In fact, most of the laws are loosey-goosey, and that's my word, loosey-goosey when it comes to that, and they're just suggesting that they uh, need to create affordable housing, but after a short period of time, they move away from that completely. Or in the case of a lot of cities, they will promise one thing, but the law and the agreement said something completely different. So they lie to their the, the population that's about to be displaced, saying that they will be able to return. Yeah. I want to bring Liddell into this because Liddell, you've done a lot of work and research on the power structure, particularly as it refers to colleges and universities. Can you talk a little bit about how colleges and universities align themselves with realtors, with the business community to really um, have their, uh, to reach their goals, their, um, of expansion? Sure. And so I'll say um, the leading thinker in higher education in the 1960s, Clark Kerr, um, gave a famed series of lectures in which he said the ideal location for uh, a university campus is between a research park on one side and a slum on the other. And he said the faculty will consult in the research park and the students will live in the slums. And it, he kind of, he says it tongue in cheek, really just kind of half joking. Universities, um, are like dedicated to expansion, right? Like all of the leading corporations from a century ago are transformed or swallowed up or gone or bankrupt. And we have the very same leading universities that are bigger and wealthier than ever. They're dedicated to growth, now even international growth. And as a result, like that expansion has to happen somewhere. Right. And so universities, in fact, kind of like slums and deterioration, they even in many cases create it. And one of the ways that they do it is through the threat of eminent domain, whether in the case of the University of California, where um, the university itself had powers of eminent domain, it would um, it would say, here are the neighborhoods that are, are the blocks that we're going to take in five years and in 10 years. And in fact, it created um, worse blighted and slum-like conditions because no one would invest in like rehabilitation of their property and it would only be um, exploitation of the property because they knew that the neighborhood had no future other than being taken by the university. In places like Chicago and in Boston, um, universities would buy property and hold on to it. They would, um, in Chicago, um, with the um, Daly administration, the University of Chicago and the Illinois Institute of Technology um, developed an agreement where code enforcement would be um, reduced, basically, because they said, we want to be able to, we want people to move out. And so it's less of a fight. Right? When universities expand, 
either they expand into expensive politically power neighborhoods on one side, or they move into um, poorer or less politically powerful neighborhoods on the other side, right? Like, which do you think that's going to be? It's always the least politically empowered and the least wealthy neighborhoods, which um, are largely um, neighborhoods of color and neighborhoods of um, with less political representation. Um, and so the kind of systemic nature and the kind of ongoing legacy of racial de uh, discrimination and racial inequality plays out in real estate. Um, and then I would also say to the specific point about your question, like look at any board of regents or board of trustees or board of visitors in the country and you will see a major real estate developer on the board or as a major benefactor of the institution. And you will also see like ongoing kind of real estate development um, activities with university foundations, for example, um, or these kind of public private partnerships. Like it's baked into the system um, that there is a kind of exploitative relationship in the nature of university expansion. You know, there's one other thing to include in that too, and that's the incentive, at least in, in our case and in many others, of federal funding, right? You can choose, There, in our case, there were 19 sites that were considered for um, a campus. Well, why wouldn't you pick the site that brings 13, at that time, $13 million of federal funds, as opposed to another site where the city would have to pay, or the state would have to pay the entire the entire amount. So, uh, and then you couple that with the the lax rules that went along with the local match to 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 allow them to uh, to claim that things that they were already doing counted toward the match. So it further put the put the bill uh, on the on on the fed, federal government and and allowed uh, allowed them to steer it towards communities of color. That's a, that's a, actually a great segue to que a question I have for you, Nobert, about the work that you are doing. And um, you said earlier that you're literally sitting in a house, right, that was, uh, that was essentially saved. Um, one of the things that I found the most interesting in the reporting that um, was done in Newport News is that um, when the city council described or when people who were very prominent during that time, we talked about power structures, um, were describing the neighborhood from the outside looking in. Um, they tried to describe it as a poor, slum-looking community, um, even though we know from our reporting that they were um, doctors and lawyers. There was a NASA scientist. So these were Black, uh, very prominent members of society living in these homes and building them. And I wanted to ask you, based on your experience talking to some of the families, because we, we, I also talked to the families in Newport News, and we talked about uh, what they essentially felt like was lost was the destruction of their community and the opportunity to continue to build those middle class homes. You seem to be able, have been able to at least uh, preserve some of the homes, but I would love for you to speak to um, the now aspect of this based on how they were, um, what was what happened to the community and the cultural and financial loss and how the people who you're speaking to now in the community feel about that and um, essentially what they feel like was lost um, based on their personal experiences? Great question. There, there was a, about a year ago, History Colorado um, came to the campus and invited uh, descendants um, who had been, been displaced, whose families had been displaced, to come and talk about, it, it was called the Museum of Memories, where, where they were invited to come and talk about what they remember about it so that that could be saved uh, for historical purposes. And the, the families themselves called it the reunion. And um, what was so special about it was uh, I thought that it was going to be a, a, a painful recalling of, of that time. And it, it, and it really, it wasn't. It was them sharing the connections that they had with their neighbors and their 
their grandparents and their aunts and uncles and cousins who lived around the corner. It was the community, the sense of community, that camaraderie that that they lost. Uh, they were all dispersed all over the city and, and they lost that. And, and that's the thing that they wanted the most. And, and you can see behind me uh, a painting of, of a church. That church was saved. Um, it's not a church anymore. It's an event center, but it's still on the campus. And uh, that's where the event was held. And, and um, th that's the piece that we're focused on the now. That, that is the focus of the now. And, and it is finding ways to work with the community to honor that sacrifice and to demonstrate on 9th Street and in other places uh, what that means. And, and so one of the things that we plan to do um, this month there's a there's another wall. It's the only wall in this house that has drywall on it, and we're painting a mural on it, um, depicting what the community described in in that event, the Museum of Memories, and and that sense of community. And the reason we're doing a mural instead of a, a painting is because you know, ten or fifteen or twenty years from now, I won't be here. Somebody, you know, the whole everyone will change. I don't want somebody to come and say, you know what, I don't like that anymore, take it down. I, I want people to say, you're gonna have to paint over it to get rid of it. It's as much permanence as we can get, but uh, it, it's gonna be violent. The, right, that act of getting rid of that image is gonna be a violent act instead of simply taking down a painting. So we wanna make sure that uh, we do, what we do lasts another 50 years and, and uh, stands the test of time. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And um, it, it uh, leads to a question to Dr. Newley Alexander, since you have done a lot with history and, you know, Nobert described the preserving of stories. Can you talk about how storytelling plays a big role in um, understanding the history of what happened? The stories that we tell now play a big role in understanding the history of what happened before. You know, one of the most important sources for storytelling when it comes to um, people of color and especially to African Americans are the Black newspapers because their perspective um, of what existed in the community, of what people were doing, was recorded there. Unlike most white newspapers, uh, who only wanted to report negative things about African Americans. It's in the Black newspapers that you read about um, the those individuals who established uh, communities, who who did exploits, and you know who contributed significantly to the area. Those individuals who were middle class, upper middle class community leaders, et cetera, et cetera. That's where you hear and read about these important stories. Like Laura Titus, who was born in Norfolk County and she attended Hampton Institute in the 1890s, uh, actually 1880s. As she was born right there during the Civil War. And so her she was essentially born a slave as a, as a child and, and became a community leader, became a teacher. And even though she married and the law said that she couldn't teach and be married at the same time, the, the city officials allowed her to continue to teach because she and her husband never had any children. And she eventually gave her her home uh, to be a, a, a place in the community as a community center. You don't see those stories anywhere else, but in Black newspapers, in the, in the materials that were collected, the oral stories that were collected. And so I'm encouraged by those universities that have been getting, that took property and, and let me just say I have not encountered any stories about any HBCUs historically black colleges or universities who are involved in taking property from African Americans if anything the properties that they had were either public properties they were land uh agricultural land that was not owned by African Americans or this was land that was actually given to the institution by African Americans who wanted to see the growth and development of HBCUs 
but you know you would see these these universities like UVA who 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 years ago took property and now they have an oral history project that go back and try to recount those stories because there's something powerful about when people are talking about the loss of their community and you don't get that anywhere else you don't get that in the in the very sterile uh city council records or you know in the po of the um planning commission records or in the court records it's in those oral accounts, some of which have been passed down, that you hear the passion, you hear and sense the loss, and you hear what the community was really like. And those are critical to us understanding the impact that these policies have had. And it goes far beyond a monetary impact. It goes into a very human, very real impact that it had on how people view their place in society and view their role in society. Yeah, that's that's great, Cassandra. You know, we've gotten a, a lot of audience questions and um, Brandy and I have done a number of these talks about our series. We've been fortunate to get the word out. One of the things that always comes up from the audience has been, what can a community do? And when I get that question, I immediately turn to a lawyer. So Jim, could you talk a little bit about what communities can do and others can jump in as well as to what sort of organizing and efforts can happen? Yeah, I'll take it from two different aspects. First of all, some of the underlying legislation laws need to be changed. The blight statutes, for example, need to be changed. So it's not somebody checking off everything wrong with the community. There has to be a way of putting in what is right about a community before it's declared blighted, before a blight study is put onto the public in a public hearing when it's too late. And then the second part of this equation is the community when it is faced with a blight can get together and must get together and fight it every way they can. You can get attorneys that can help for very little cost sometimes if it's a just cause. But more importantly, if you make enough noise before the planning commission, before the permitting agencies that have to permit the process, the funders who fund this process, the whether it's the federal government or state government, people need to have delegations to go to those. Make noise, be loud, and do it as often as you can. Uh, I think it's incredibly important that the community that is trying to better the society by having a new highway or a new redevelopment or an expanded university makes it clear that the community might, might not be on board. And if you create enough political friction, it's not going to happen as easily. So reform the law and make yourself known. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I do want to go back to one thing that uh, Cassandra said, and and it reminded me of a, a, another uh, issue that is being reported. Uh, it came out in the High Country News, how uh, land grant universities uh, were established and, and the, the myth that public lands, free public lands were given to land grant universities. Not so, right? Those, those public lands were Native American tribal lands. Many, many, many of them, hundreds of millions of acres were taken from Native American uh, uh, tribes for public use and then given to universities uh, for their benefit. And so uh, it's not true everywhere, but it is certainly true across the country, uh, state, states uh, all over the country, and um, specifically for, for university uh, benefit. Thank you. Uh, so we have, um, before we get into our audience uh, Q&A, we have uh, one more question for the panelists. Um, I think it's a great question to sort of capture everything that we've talked about. And um, the question is, you know, we got a lot of inquiries about what universities can do. And um, I think Jamesy did a great job of sort of explaining what um, people can do. I would love for everyone to sort of tackle this question. We don't have a lot of time. So um, if you can kind of maybe devote like one or two minutes to answering it so we can um, devote a, a little more time to the Q&A. But, um, you know, how can universities meaningfully address 
these um, circumstances that occurred in communities of color where they were displaced by the expansions of these institutions decades ago? How can they address, meaningfully address these today, this issue today? I mean, I would just say um, a community needs a lawyer, but a community also needs like a local historian. All of this is like pretty well documented and that with work in the archives, you a, a community can make the case that there were kind of wrongful, wrongful decisions and um, exploitative transactions. And like, I think that that is part of the process of building public support and I think building like shame, um, like pushing universities to action, right? There has to be sort of consult, uh, concerted and multifaceted pressure upon universities. No university is going to do um, like take reparative public policy out of the goodness of their hearts, right? They have to be pushed and you got to bring the receipts. That, that's not true in our case. Today, today, <laughs> let, me, let me let me say today. That's not true today. Um, uh, when we uh, when we uh, made the announcement, it, it was uh, it was not because um, of public pressure. It wasn't. It was the right thing to do. It was the recognition that it was the right thing to do, and and it took folks at the highest levels. Uh, of the university to recognize that before it happened, certainly, but um, but it it didn't happen like that in in our case. Um, I, I think in in cases like that, you get the least uh, amount back, right? They'll do the they'll do just enough to shut you up, uh, as opposed to the most that they can do. And and so for in our for our uh, case, we did the most we could do to begin with. The most we could do is free tuition for their in perpetuity, right? Uh, and 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 we'll figure it out uh, as we go. But um, in 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 other communities where that isn't the case, where you don't have advocates um, at the highest levels, then then you have to have a different approach. You do have to have a different approach. You know, I'll, I'll jump in and and. Um in thinking about reparative justice, I think a lot of these universities need to think about the image that they're projecting. Um, if you've taken land from people, you've erased their presence. Um, what, what are you, who are you representing on these campuses? What images are you projecting? Are you projecting an image that says that these people never existed here? Um, and I'm not talking about a little monument here or there or a little plaque someplace. That to me is insulting. Um, but, you know, if I if I go on campus, whose images am I seeing on that campus? Who's being represented? Who's being welcomed into that campus? Because, yes, it's fine to have scholarships, but I went to a predominantly white institution and I can tell you that I was not welcomed. I got called the N word all the time. Yes, it was a long time ago, but I've heard that things like that still exist today. And so you, you have to create a different environment that reflects a different culture other than the one that took over that property in order to to begin a reparative justice. And then you have to think about the land that was taken from people. You know, where, where is now the inheritable wealth for that family? And I think that, that we have to stop saying, well, I wasn't alive during that period. So, you know, it doesn't matter if you were alive or, or not alive during that period, you're still, in many cases, either the benefactor of what happened or you are being harmed by what happened. And so in order to stop this cycle, we have to shift and, and really engage in some reparative justice when it comes to how do we restore what was lost? 
how, you know, and I'm not talking about tear down the university to give the land back, but I'm saying that you destroyed a community. How do you restore that community and that sense of, of together and belonging? And, and instead of saying, well, you know, I washed my hands of it because it was in the past. And so I think that that we definitely need to push that conversation in that direction and then begin to work out a plan for how do we restore what was taken and lost so that that there can be a repairing. And you also need to set up a plan for fixing the law so it doesn't happen in the future. Because we don't want to have a panel 50 years from now saying what a horrible things were done starting in the 2020s. Law schools, for example, I think have a responsibility for looking very deeply into the nature of the law that allowed this to happen in the first place, and then work for ways of fixing the law, not only blight statutes, but the entire structure of using eminent domain for redevelopment purposes, where the people benefiting from it are not the people that are being affected the most. So I think there's, there's a a full range of things that can be done by the university campuses, uh, starting with looking at the structure, starting about what do we do with the people in the past, as Cassandra said, and then moving forward from there. But uh, we can't let this continue and certainly can't let it happen again. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, we only have maybe like a minute or so for a question. I think we kind of got to some of the questions through some of your answers. But um, does anybody just have any quick last thoughts before we wrap up this um, discussion today? Yeah, and I, I'd like to know if you see quickly what the future of, of university development is and, um, and is there a right way for universities to do it or governments to do it? That's a good question. In a minute, you can't possibly answer that question. It would take <laughs> days to get at that question right. But I think if nothing else, now is the time to start looking into it and exploring all possibilities. And, and, and I would just say having this conversation, I think, is very valuable. It, it, it's not it's not common to have this kind of, kind of conversation. And, and it ha has to happen um, uh, uh, in a more widespread way. And, and folks need to hear it all the variations of it. Um, and, and and that's how we get to to reconciliation. Yeah. I would say that um, the the recognition, the increasing recognition that this is, as you said at the outset, not simply an isolated case, but then the fact that there's widespread um, and, and shared strategies among universities, I think can help communities kind of organize and develop in a more effective uh, conversations with universities. And um, a book I always recommend, Devarian Baldwin's In the Shadow of the Ivory Tower, mm -hmm. um, kind of works through kind of recent cases of university expansion and the kind of relationship um, between universities and their lo local communities. Like we look to universities for a wide array of public benefits, individual development, like regional, national economic development. Um, but that is that cost is always borne by the communities immediately around, right? The benefits are widespread and the people who are in opposition and who bear the cost of that growth, that expansion are the neighborhoods right around. And so I think recognizing that can help um, shift the balance of power in these kind of community negotiations. And I think that we should stop talking about um, the the raucous um, behavior and attitudes and perspectives of people today, uh, dividing people along racial, ethnic, uh, religious lines, and and really begin to recognize that either we find a solution together, or we go down the tubes together. It's going to be one or the other. Uh, we are a single society. We are not a bifurcated society, though we have behaved that way in the past. And it's to our harm, not to our, our good. And so we're at a very important crossroads uh, as we are heading into 2024. This is really the official beginning of the 21st century. And we have to make a decision 
are we going to be a society that can move forward? And you cannot move forward with all of the things that we have done to harm people in the past. And if you, we find a way to work to, to work together, that is how we create reconciliation, not someone from the outside who wasn't harmed telling the people who were harmed what they will do to fix the situation. That's never a good step to move forward.